All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. We're gonna give it just one more minute and then we'll kick this call off. All right, let's go ahead and get started for this evening. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, it is so great to be with you tonight. Uh, my name is Julia Barnes with Team Beat Hero. Um, we are glad you could join us this evening. It's a really special day. Beyond just our awesome panel, we are thrilled to say that the trailer for Not Going Quietly, the amazing documentary about Adi dropped today. Um, we're going to play the trailer a little bit later, but I want to encourage you guys to go to notgoingquietlyfilm.com. Watch it, find showtimes. It's going to be in select cities on August 12th, and it's hitting a bunch of festivals across the country. So I really encourage you um, to get out there and check it out. It's a great film. Uh, so for our program tonight, um, uh, we're at a really critical moment in our country, both in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and also as we look ahead to what we can do to rebuild and move forward under this new administration. One of the focuses for Be a Hero since the 2020 primary is how to position ourselves in the best way to win the fight for Medicare for all in a smart, inclusive way that recognizes the shifting obstacles of our political landscape and holds fast to our value that healthcare is a human right. So tonight, we're really lucky to get to hear from some really important voices in that fight. I am so pleased to welcome New York City public advocate and activist Jumani Williams, the woman whose whiteboard terrifies Republicans, uh, Representative Katie Porter, and of course, our host, uh, national renowned Medicare for All leader and um, host of the spectacular podcast America Dissected, uh, Dr. Abdul El Said. We're going to get to hear from all of our guests and then have a discussion together about the steps we can take to keep fighting. We expect this to run about an hour and we'll be respectful of time this evening, so we have plenty of opportunity to get to your questions. Uh, so without further ado, I am really pleased to pass the mic to Abdul. Julia, thank you so much. It is an honor and privilege to, to be here with you all. Uh, be a Hero is an organization doing incredible work. Um, founded in the, the the will and the fight of someone uh, I, I I consider a brother uh, and a good friend, uh, our, our friend Adi Barkin. He um, has reminded us uh, yet again uh, how important it is to to recognize both the needs of people uh, whom our society tends to forget, uh, and also to situate that within a broader policy framework uh, that always advocates and calls us to the highest ideals of justice uh, and and equity and. Um, I, I, I can't not talk about uh, the the absurd elephant in the room, which is the fact that we are living now through the 17th month of uh, an unparalleled uh, pandemic that has taken 600,000 lives and counting uh, and, 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 and millions livelihoods more. Um, and when we think about what we are here to talk about today, Medicare for all, uh, it's important for us to remember just how precarious uh, our healthcare system has been to this challenge. We watched as millions of people lost their health insurance in the midst uh, of the early days of the pandemic because we're the only high income country in the world that systematically ties access to health insurance to employment. We watched as our brave nurses and doctors and uh, healthcare providers were trying to care for patients in hospitals that were fighting both bankruptcy and COVID-19 at the same time, who've listened to the consultants who told them that medicine is just like any other service and that you should uh, you should supply your basic needs just in time. Uh, well, just in time means you don't have time in the midst of a pandemic. And so we watch these folks uh, care for uh, sick and dying people in garbage bags and uh, in PPE that have been used for literally months. Um, and at the same time, we've watched 47 hospitals in 2020 alone either go bankrupt or, uh, or, or, or shut down completely because uh, COVID-19 meant that they had to cancel their most lucrative uh, elective procedures. And meanwhile, we watched the insurance industry make absolute bank. They made billions of dollars more than the billions of dollars they already usually make. Uh, and they spent $151 million of that money across 845 lobbyists uh, to tell us why the status quo was working for us. Meanwhile, uh, we are in the midst of a circumstance that is, uh, that is, 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 is barreling down on millions of people for whom uh, the choice between a life and a livelihood 
uh, was made quite clear. We invented a new word called essential uh, for people we actually in our society deem expendable every day. Um, and folks are living with the trauma and the insecurity uh, of the sets of decisions that we made long before we ever faced this pandemic. And what's sad to me is that we are in a situation where we are actively looking at those decisions and saying, yeah, you know, that's all right. You know, the, the system is working. And the question we have to be asking is working for whom and why? Uh, and, and for too long, uh, we have watched a system of our politics that is defined to be working when large corporations get to exclude the poorest of us while extracting from the rest of us. And so long as they're making money and telling us all it's working, uh, spending millions in, uh, of dollars on ads to remind us that we're going to lose more than we have to gain, uh, then, in fact, we swallow that status quo. And I think this is a moment for us to stand up and say enough is enough. Um, the beautiful thing about, about Audi and Be a Hero is that they've been about that work um, since, uh, since 2017, 2018, uh, recognizing that is, there is so much more we can gain if we're willing to invest in one another, invest in a society uh, that's founded on the ideals of equity uh, and justice. And if we are willing to stand up to the corporations who tell us that, in fact, we can't have nice things. Um, and so today, I I'm really honored to, to, to be in, uh, in community with two folks who have been fighting that fight. <laughs> Uh, in, 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 in the halls of power. Um, Katie Porter needs no introduction, but uh, I'm gonna offer it anyway. Um, uh, Congresswoman Katie Porter represents the 45th Congressional District in Orange County, California, serving in her second term. Before coming to Congress, Representative Porter spent nearly two decades taking on the special interests that dominate American politics and drown out the voices of working families. A lifelong consumer advocate, she taught bankruptcy law at the University of California, Irvine School of Law. As California's independent watchdog against the banks, she oversaw big banks that had cheated Orange County homeowners to get them to follow through on their promise to help families get back on their feet. As a consumer finance expert, Congresswoman Porter also helped Congress pass the original Credit Card Act in 2009, which enacted federal protections from abusive credit cards, uh, credit card fees. Representative Porter is a single mom of three school-aged children, and she lives in her uh, with her family in Irvine, California. I'll be honest with you. Um, I remember watching uh, a viral video, one of many, uh, that featured a whiteboard and uh, was immediately taken uh, by the combination of both grit and intellect uh, that Representative Porter puts on display every day in Congress. Uh, she is the kind of leader who uh, we can all look to and know that she fights the fight because she understands who she fights for. Um, and so without further ado, I am really excited to uh, hand the mic over uh, to uh, all of our friend, uh, our fighter, Representative Katie Porter. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, good evening, all of you. Thank you so much, Abdul, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to Adi Barkin and the whole Be A Hero team, um, both those who organized events and those who are sitting and listening and who are gonna share this video um, with all of the people who are supporting the Be A Hero um, work that we're doing. Um, I'm really excited to be here with uh, Jumanji um, to talk about why we need Medicare for All and how we might get there. Um, when I first ran for Congress in 2018, I ran here in Orange County, in Central Orange County, against a woman who had been elected, a Republican, who had been elected by 17 points. And when I ran, I ran on Medicare for All. In my five-way primary, um, in my general, and I won. And part of the reason that I won was that I explained to people, Republicans, independents, Democrats, I explained to Americans why Medicare for All will improve the quality of our healthcare system and bring down the costs. So it's a win-win for people. There's not a trade-off between costs and quality. There's not a trade-off between accessibility and the bottom line. And so that is a really, really important part of who I became as a candidate, how I ran, and how I managed to hold this seat in a difficult 2020 cycle. Um, when I, before, um, Abdul mentioned that I was a law professor before I ran for Congress, I was a student of Elizabeth Warren's and went into bankruptcy courts and did some of those very first studies with her on families who were going broke, many of them insured. And that's an important thing to understand. Many of them insured who were going broke because of 
deductibles um, because of an out-of-pocket maximum that was completely out of reach because of costs that were not covered. Um, and so I saw that firsthand. I went into bankruptcy courts and listened to those families' stories. Um, and it was a big part of why I wanted to run um, was to take on this challenge of, of expanding health care. Um, when I think about Medicare for All and health care reform generally, I really bring to it my perspective as a consumer advocate. And this is a wonderful way to engage people on healthcare um, because so many of them as consumers, whether as you know, voters or ideologues or um, cable TV watchers, they may get different views on healthcare, but as consumers, their experience with healthcare is almost universally the same and it's almost universally frustrating. And we know this, um, surveys show that the most satisfied Patients, the most satisfied consumers in our, our healthcare system, ecosystem, are people with Medicare. People with private insurance are actually very down on private insurance. It does not work for them when they get sick. It does not work for them when they are not trying to figure out what's affordable. It does not work for them when the cost of the benefits go up every year and the amount and the quality of the benefits go down. Um, and so I try to talk with people about what would Medicare for all do? Um, and I talk about the amount of dollars that are wasted in doctor's offices and in provider's offices, processing payments, time that is away from patient care. I talk about how that is discouraging the best and the brightest from going into medicine and staying in primary care practices. Um, I talk about prescription drug negotiation. Right? What kind of capitalist market do we have when you are prohibited the biggest purchaser from negotiating drug prices? Um, and so when you look across the board, we have a system in our current health insurance system, it is not a market. So every time someone says to me, I'm not for Medicare for all, I'm for a market-based solution. What I wanna remind them is if they're for a market-based solution, they have a hell of a lot of work to do because we do not have a market-based solution right now. You cannot choose the insurance you want because your employer is selecting the choices for you in many cases. You cannot shop on either price or quality when it comes to physicians or other care providers because that information is suppressed and hidden. You cannot negotiate. You cannot get your disputes resolved because of arbitration clauses. In other words, in increasing consolidation in hospitals, uh, private equity buying them up, pharmaceutical mergers. When you think about the hallmarks of what it means to have a marketplace, it's things like consumer choice. It's things like price transparency. It's things like negotiation. It's, it's things like competition. By all those metrics, our healthcare system fails the test of being a functional market. So the alternative is to create something that is purely market driven, which means that when people get sick, if they can't afford it, they'll die. Even more so than we have today. And that's already a problem in the current system. Or we can say people's lives, matters of life and death, aren't about dollars and cents. They're about providing for all. This is an issue about workforce readiness. It's an issue about the ability to globally compete in the workforce. It's an issue about human dignity. It's an issue about racial justice. Medicare for All delivers on all of those measures. So when I think about Medicare for All, particularly here in places like Orange County in red districts, I make very clear to people, you're worried about your taxes going up? You must be a Medicare for All supporter. You must understand that Medicare for all will drive down the costs of health care for all Americans while increasing the quality. Oh, you're really concerned about the quality of health care? You must be a Medicare for all supporter. Did you know that Medicare for all delivers the best outcomes for patients at the lowest price point? So I think we need to be very aggressive in affirmatively making the case for Medicare for all and challenging some of these assumptions which are not accidents. They are not misunderstandings. They are pushed out, marketed uh, business, uh, big business talking points. They are coming straight from the pharma industry. They are coming straight from those who benefit from the kind of healthcare system we have today. Um, and so I think everybody who is saying that they are for the people, that they are for, they want the best outcomes for the people they represent, 
should be a champion for Medicare for All. In Congress, we have seen support for Medicare for All really grow. And right now, I just want to mention one piece of evidence for that. I'm obviously a co-sponsor of Medicare for All. I'm the deputy chair of the Progressive Caucus, and I'm so proud to work with Pramila Jayapal, um, who I continue to learn from um, about how we can advocate for Medicare for All and the benefits that it would provide. But I want to mention one sort of insight into where I think we're going um, with support for Medicare, which is right now one of the things on the table in this budget bill is an expansion of Medicare. And it's a potential expansion in two ways. One is expanding Medicare to cover vision, dental, and hearing. You simply cannot be healthy if you are, uh, if these things are, if you are having an illness of the eye or you're having an illness of your teeth. Um, and so we need to expand Medicare coverage that way. We're also talking though about bringing down the age of Medicare eligibility. Um, and there's been discussion about 62, about 60. These are not a substitute for a full Medicare for all system, but they're progress. And what I wanna share with you today is through the efforts of Pramila and others, there are 17 members in really tough seats who are supporting this kind of Medicare expansion. So we are seeing people in tough districts step up and support Medicare. And I'm one of them, but I'm not alone. There are others. Mike Levin, my colleague to the South, is in a tough district. Um, and so this is, people want this. Not Democrats, people, Republicans, independents, young people, older people, people who want to start businesses, people who want different choices in their healthcare providers than what their employer provided coverage will, will give them. Um, and so I think that you know we're at a real place where we need to keep explaining and keep pushing forward. And it's difficult. This has been a, to put it mildly, a very difficult period in our country's history, both in terms of the, de the demo democracy risks with both January 6th and the election, um, and also in terms of COVID and some of those pandemic needs, uh, what the pandemic has put on us in terms of burdens. But we can't take our eye off the ball on Medicare for All, and I'm committed to pushing forward on it and happy to be here in conversation with you tonight. With that, I'm delighted to turn it over um, to uh, Juwan Williams. Um, thank you so much and looking forward to hearing from you. Can I just jump in? I, I didn't give uh, Jumani his due with uh, introduction, so let me just give him a, a full introduction here. So Jumani Williams, um, Williams has served as New York City's public advocate since 2019. Prior, he represented the 45th district in the New York City Council in Brooklyn from 2009 to 2019. During his time in city council, he championed police accountability and public safety, showing us that the two aren't just not mutually exclusive, but they're actually mutually connected. He also championed affordable housing uh, and stood tall with the most marginalized in the city of New York. Um, lucky to uh, to have him today. And, uh, and with that, uh, Jumani, take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Congress members. It's an honor to be here on with you all and the people who are watching. Big shout out to Be A Hero and, of course, uh, Artie Bakken, uh, who is just a hero and inspiration to all of us. Uh, I've been in spaces with Artie for quite some time, either working on the abuses of Stop, Question, and Frisk, and uh, when we were at Occupy Wall Street and a whole bunch of other issues. So I'm, I'm just honored to, to continue to see him doing the work that he's doing. Peace and blessings to everyone, love and light. Um, you know, uh, it was interesting to hear how uh, Doctor started off talking about where we are now in the in the pandemic, um, and here in New York, it's interesting because we we became the epicenter of the epicenter. And I, I want to say that because I have my folks, it is not just uh, Republicans that are often uh, blocking this stuff. It's Republicans. I'm sorry, it's Democrats as well. And I always want to make that clear. Uh, the our governor Andrew Cuomo. Uh, was lauded as a hero uh, for quite some time. And many of us were saying, actually, he's not. And there's many things he's doing wrong that's harming us even during this pandemic. A lot of those things are coming to light now. But I just want to make clear on a lot of these issues. Uh, some of our Democratic colleagues are, are, are blocking some things as well. Uh, health uh, healthcare has always been important to me. Actually, just today introduced uh, in the city council a package of legislation to deal with uh, the tragedies of Black maternal health. Um, and that's a huge issue, and I think we can get a, a, a start start getting at it and locally, even if the federal government is not moving. We've been pushing around issues of uh, mental health uh, for quite some time. One of the reasons that I've 
always pushed these things more holistically is for me, a lot of things are connected to public safety. And that's the thing that I think sometimes people miss the connection. Uh, and if we haven't seen it during this pandemic, uh, we're gonna miss it. The connection of healthcare and access to health uh, and to uh, public safety. If we had addressed so many of these issues before the pandemic, we probably wouldn't have been hit as hard as we were. You know, here in the city, uh, we're trying to work with uh, Universal. Uh, the mayor has pushed forth uh, two parts to try to get Universal done. Uh, we're not there yet. And of course, in the state, uh, they're trying hard to push forward uh, a true uh, single payer uh, health care. Um, I'm sure that our governor will give good lip service, but I don't know if it will get done. But oftentimes when these things are not being done, uh, there's just somebody making a lot of money or someone trying to hold on to power or both. And in this case, you can literally just draw a line to people who are making money and the people who are trying to prevent uh, people from having access to the health care they need. My, my father, may rest in peace, uh, was a physician. My sister's a nurse practitioner. My mother's a pharmacist. So health care has always uh, been a topic of discussion in, in our household. And what we've been able to do in so many cases was just awesome inside-outside game uh, to get things done. And I always want to just keep inspiring folks to understand that the activism that we're doing is really what pushes these things to happen. And so with the work we did around the abuse to stop and frisk uh, only happened because we had good folks on the inside and people continue to push us uh, on the outside. And that's important here. And the messaging is important. Um, very often the people, not the, the leaders who know sometimes know what they're doing, but the people who are being misused have no idea what it is they're fighting against. And so you have people who are fighting against universal and uh, healthcare uh, against the Affordable Care Act, but they wanted to keep the insurance they had through the Affordable Care Act. And so uh, I, I'm hoping that as we continue the strategy to move forward, we remember that we can bring some of the people, a lot of the people along who are opposing these things, because very often they have no idea that they're opposing the things that are protecting their own family. And as the Congressman pointed out, the issues that they bring up, um, they really are saying, yes, we do want these things. We do want universal uh, health care, uh, but they've been told that these words are, are bad, or anathema to uh, what America is. And my hope is that as we continue this fight, um, sometimes it's easy to get into the uh, frustration of it, uh, but we have to unpack it because I honestly believe uh, all of the, the colors of America, people want the same things. Uh, that they're, they're being told that they're being prevented from having these things because of those that are deemed other. Uh, and we have to do a good job of showing them no, it's because people who have money want to keep making money. And universal health care or um, single payer health care or Medicare for all is one of those things. We, and the number one reason that many of the leaders point out, it's usually money. It's not even health care. It's how much it's going to cost. That's what's happening here in New York State. And we, we are literally saying the reason we cannot get health care to everyone is because it costs too much and it's better off uh, if we just allow people to die. That is a message that we have to do better at, at, at getting to folks. Uh, and I'm hoping to be a, a part of that. And I'm looking forward to the questions that are coming, uh, that are gonna be coming in. I'm just honored to be here with folks, but I believe we can get it done. Uh, and thanks to folks like Adi, keeps, keeps my spirit up whenever it starts going down. Well, thank you for, uh, for uh, those comments. Uh, I, I really appreciate both of your perspectives on this, I think you bring um, unique perspectives to this conversation and uh, also remind us about the multi-pronged nature of healthcare in our lives. Uh, Representative Porter, I wanna start with you um, with, with, a, with a question. We, we're often, uh, uh, we're often uh, advertised to by the corporations who dominate our healthcare system about how Medicare for all would take away our choice, right? And, um, and that the loss of choice would be this devastating thing. And you know, my experience with choosing between health insurance, and I say this as someone with, with two doctorates in health and uh, my, my partner is also a physician, like when we have to decide what health insurance we want, we need to pull out like a full on actuarial table and do a bunch of calculations about the probability of us getting sick or Sarah getting pregnant and then figure out which is gonna be the cheapest and probably the best coverage. And that's a hard set of calculations to make understanding the system. That's the choice that they tell us that we wanna have. As you think about how we, 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 we take this on and take on the powers that be in this area, 
how have you thought about um, in your conversations with your constituents and in the broader American public, how should we be talking about choice? What is the choice that we actually want to protect and how does Medicare for all do that for us? Yep, this is a terrific question and it's just one of the, it's just the right frame to be talking about this. So I want to talk about two places that people should, in my opinion, be able to make choices about their care. One under the current system is what we're told is people can choose the insurance that they want. That is simply not true. Many, many employers offer exactly one insurance plan. And even if you work for a large insurer and you're able to have a choice of two or three plans, I too, Abdul, people, when I got to Congress, we have our insurance through the Affordable Care Act, through the exchange. Many, many members asked me what plan I picked. And I said, well, but my situation, like I have three kids and I'm a single mom. I'm like, my kids are, you know, obviously going to stay in California. And so like, I don't know that my choice should be your choice. And they said, I just can't figure out what to do at all. So I just thought I'd pick what you pick and hope for the best. So you're absolutely right now. And not only, by the way, if you did spend hundreds of hours and you do get out the actuarial tables and you are people like Abdul and me and you, you dig in and, and you read the fine print on your plan and you try to find out if your providers are covered, just understand that health insurance companies can change the terms after you buy. So the provider that you had six months later when you actually get sick is no longer covered. Um, by the way, the coverage they said they'd cover, they deem medically unnecessary. So even if you were to get this incredibly complex, even if you have a choice of providers, of insurance companies, and, which is not always true, even if you have a choice, and you make the choice, you are then not able to count on getting, for example, mental health coverage, no providers in network, no providers in your area, right? All of these things, you don't actually have a choice. The other kind of choice I want to talk about is this idea of choosing your doctor, which we know is very, the Americans really care about this. People want to be able to choose the provider that they've had, that they're comfortable with, that, that is, meets their needs, both medically, culturally, you know, in terms of geography. You go ahead, America, or insurance company. You go ahead. You show me the private insurance company that has the depth and breadth of network of Medicare, because it's not out there. Quite simply, people who are on Medicare have the most choice in healthcare of any healthcare provider. Now, that's not to say that every provider takes Medicare, but to be clear, there are more physicians in more kinds of practices who take Medicare than any competitive type of private insurance. So if we want to expand choice, for patients, we would have Medicare for all. I really appreciate that. And, and, and thank you for, for breaking that down, right? Because it, it is the choice of doctors that we care about. Um, uh, Advocate Williams, you, you talked about an area that, um, that I, I'm, I, I share a deep passion for, and that's addressing uh, racial disparities in, in health, particularly uh, among, among mothers and, and, and babies. And I, I um, had the privilege of serving the city of Detroit as health director. And it was fascinating, right? Because uh, I, I came in after the expansion of Medicaid uh, in the state, which was a fantastic thing, but 50% of Detroiters are on Medicaid. And the challenge with Medicaid is that it just doesn't reimburse at the same rate as private insurance, which means that doctors uh, have a hard time actually keeping practices open. And when we wanted to take on the infant mortality rates in the city, which are sky high, we realized that one of the most important things we could do is provide lift rides to get moms who are who had a prenatal care appointments to their appointments, which were often downtown uh, and, and, and serving uh, a far richer uh, 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 subset of the city. Um, as you think about the fight for Medicare for all in New York, which of course is a, a deeply diverse and also a geographically quite segregated city, how does Medicare for all help us get to uh, taking on uh, the, 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 the shameful uh, maternal and infant mortality rate uh, disparities that we see uh, across race in, in the city and across our country. Thank you so much for that. And um, just thank you for, you know, there's some things that people often don't realize uh, and they, they sometimes think so grand and trying to affect um, communities that have been marginalized. And you'd be 
you'd be surprised at how many times something as simple as a ride to a place um, can change somebody's whole life. And that's why you need the right people working on these issues because people sometimes are trying to solve the problem without addressing uh, what's the real concern. Um, I would say, and I thank the Congressman for pointing out, uh, one of the best insurances I've ever had, there was a, a time where I, I was an employee when I was younger, it was, and they had just started introducing um, these independent uh, insurances based on, on, on Medicare. It was actually the best insurance I've ever had in my entire life, better than the insurance I have now and have had uh, since. And to that point as well, in the city, one of the uh, one of the uh, insurances that people usually pick if you're a city employee is was GHI now purchased by Emblem. Um, if you're from if you work in New York City, you know what it is. But GHI, it's because it's the cheapest. Uh, but there are a lot of doctors who don't accept it, and so you can't sometimes get the care you need. Uh, and when something such as uh, mental health, and I've been being on mental health, and I've been seeing a therapist for uh, probably going on five years now, best thing I ever did in my life. Uh, but uh, it was hard to find someone who I felt was culturally competent to uh, assist me. Uh, and some other insurances have a, a wider breadth. Uh, and having what was important is discussing the choice. Right? And I love the way we're breaking that down because people are fed these misconceptions and then they feed upon itself. And being able to point out, well, actually with Medicare for all, it will actually uh, broaden the doctors that you can see. It will actually give you even more services. Now, that's something that people don't understand. They, they really think that things are being taken from them. Um, what we're doing now uh, with the uh, uh, Black maternal, maternal Health is just a, even asking folks, forcing folks to provide a patient's bill of rights. You know, my wife, uh, when she, I have a stepdaughter, awesome stepdaughter, uh, when she gave birth 12 years ago, um, didn't even know she had the right to refuse a cesarean section and ask for natural birth. And that's the thing that most black women are told they should do when they come into the hospital. And so something as simple as that uh, uh, can, can help us out. But in many instances, people uh, don't even have access to the insurance they need. Um, to tell you the amount of people who passed through the pandemic um, or who are unemployed and decided not to get uh, medical services they needed, come to find out um, after they get employed and finally get insurance or when they can come back outside, they're on worse condition before if they had gotten some simple checkups. And so access to not just healthcare, but healthcare that helps provide uh, cultural competency in a geographic area where people uh, can access it uh, will do a great deal uh, to deal with some of the inequities that we see uh, in the communities who are actually always suffering the most and who are always hit the hardest. And healthcare, including mental health, is a big part of that. I, I want to um, just uh, pose, a, pose a final question uh, to both of you. Um, you. You guys work in, in, in very different um, spaces in government, but uh, you are, um, you know, you're progressives because you believe that government uh, can be and ought to be a part of the solution. Um, as you think about what needs to happen now, right, um, it's unlikely that under this administration, we're going to get Medicare for all. And as you mentioned, uh, Advocate Williams, it's unlikely that under the Cuomo administration, New York is going to pass single payer. But it, it strikes me that what we choose to do in this moment may, in fact, uh, determine when and in, in, in maybe even if um, we get there in, in the space of our lives. What do you want to see from folks who are working outside government right now to create Medicare for all? What is it that uh, you need from us uh, to get it done? So I, I think that's a great question. Um, I think one of the things is to really focus on um, expanding people, um, expanding the number of candidates who are winning in red areas, um, who are so so-called flipping people like me who are flipping seats frontliners you can run and win on medicare for all now it's not just that i'll be there voting yes when that day comes when we're able to pass medicare for all it's that i'm in a community talking about with my constituents listening to their health care concerns and talking about how medicare for all would address it 
that is an ongoing, continual part about how we get there and how we do that. Um, and so I think this is why I think some of the people who are stepping up and supporting Medicare expansion, lowering the eligibility age, expanding coverage, that we're seeing people do that who are folks like Jared Golden in Maine, in a, who's, who's far from a progressive, and I don't, I don't think Chair would be offended to hear me say that. Um, I think that that is actually really, really good progress um, that we're doing that. I think the other thing is, you know, my sister is a physician um, and also a two-time cancer survivor, as a, and my brother-in-law is a physician. I think it's really important for people in healthcare. Nurses have obviously taken a huge role here. Um, you know, National Nurses United and those folks um, have done a great job, but I think it's really important for those people who work in medical education, um, those people who are, you know, who are seeing on the ground the, the cost of the patients and the way that they are not the financial costs, the health costs to their patients from Medicare for All be speaking up. Um, and the last thing I've been really encouraged by, and we have a group of, I think, over 300 businesses here in California um, that is part of an alliance for, for a healthy California, is to see business owners start talking about Medicare for All. We have a number of people who are small business owners, medium-sized business owners, and increasingly large business owners who say, we want to focus on our business. And our business is engineering, or our business is construction, or our business is manufacturing, whatever it is. Our business isn't deciding whether someone needs an MRI or not. Our business isn't deciding what health two health plans someone should be limited to in the upcoming calendar year. Our business isn't deciding what kind of out-of-pocket maximum or deductible is affordable for our patients. So I think that the leadership here from the business community, from entrepreneurs, from small business owners, that is also a really, really important group to activate here along with providers. And that's not to leave aside the grassroots work, the, the work that we're all doing in town halls and at gatherings like this, but I think those are two constituencies that the day this comes, I'm pretty sure those are two constituencies that are gonna be part of the push. Um, I think it's a great uh, question also. You know, one, um, I'm not, you know, although I'm a Democrat, I was not, a, and I'm not a biggest uh, Biden fan. So I'm just gonna uh, be clear about that, but I obviously was better than what we had um, and, you know, one of the differences we had a megalomaniac and every day you were doing something different. So uh, that was a problem. Like we couldn't even stay focused on the, th the stupid thing you're doing for that day. So at least we have someone uh, here who's uh, a, a lot more intelligent and at least more, uh, you know, a, a more able to, to do the job, which I think is helpful. What I would like to see happen is one we continue to keep the pressure on. Like we can't put our foot off the gas uh, from the fight. I would also like to see a little bit more um, connectivity. Sometimes we're doing these fights in silos. So you have someone work, we have folks working on policing issues here, someone on healthcare here, someone on education here, public safety there. I do think we uh, who believe in these things have to do a better job of interconnecting them uh, because they're all interconnected. <laughs> I also think that we have to do a, a good job of understanding that um, we are where we are on purpose. <laughs> so it's not by accident. The system was created to kind of do the things that it's doing. And so we sometimes can get frustrated and people who sound really ignorant in what they're saying, um, but we have to remember they're, they're being fed this. They're in um, oftentimes in echo chambers uh, that are repeating things that just aren't true. And so we have to find a way to kind of break through that. And because I honestly believe that our message is the right one. Our message protects the most people. Our message is based in equity and there are people who profit from inequity. There are people who profit from these things. And the more we can point that out, the more we can have the patience to continue fighting through the rhetoric that we're hearing, understanding why we're hearing it, and that the people who are sometimes spouting it are suffering themselves, being able to show that connection um, will be uh will be the most helpful and i know that's hard because it's, it's a long fight long a, a long push but i think we can do it i think we can do it actually in our lifetimes we just have to have to keep pushing uh both republicans and democrats and, and we'll elect keep electing more people like congressman porter um it gives us a, a lot of hope and then you have advocate when you get a little tired uh just think of addy barking 
on that note, um, I appreciate <clears throat> both of you for your fight and uh, your belief in a future that is more just and, and more equitable than this one. I want to um, uh, to remind us that that we're here to 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 help support a vision of that future, and be a hero is doing that work. And so I'm going to hand it over. They're going to show uh, the incredibly inspiring. I just took a look at it. Um, new uh, trailer for uh, the uh, film that was made about Audi. Uh, not going quietly, but in the interim, as you watch this, I want you to ask yourself what it means to to support that vi vision. Obviously, Audi has uh, put his life uh, on the line for this, and he has been fighting for it um, for uh, for years now. And um, you'll get a sense of, of what that means for him. Now, the question you have to ask for yourself is, what does that mean for you? Uh, and if Audi can give his life to this fight, I think you can give a couple hundred bucks. And so my ask is, uh, as you watch this, I want you to ask what it's worth to you uh, and go to beaherofund.com, excuse me, I think it's beaherofund.org uh, to, uh, to give. Um, and, uh, and, and please do give generously. This is about uh, actualizing a vision that we talked about today. And that doesn't happen without putting uh, our time and our treasure uh, into it. And so you've given your time today. My ask is that you give a bit of your treasure uh, to help us get there. So um, Team Be A Hero, take it away. to tell the story about my friend, Addie Barkin. He's been an activist and an organizer all of his life. With us today is Addie Barkin. I can't do Addie's story justice. I will let him tell it. After Carl was born, we felt like we had reached the mountaintop. Say hi. And then, out of the clear blue sky, we were struck by lightning. I was diagnosed with ALS today. The knowledge that I was dying was terrible, but dealing with my insurance company was even worse. I wanted to spend every moment I had left with Rachel and Carl, but then Congress came after our health care. I couldn't stay quiet any longer. My next guest made headlines when he confronted a Republican senator on an airplane. This is your moment the American hero. All right, ready to rumble. We decided to start a movement. To urge people to stand up, confront the elected officials. All right, I'm gonna knock on your door. Did you just get out of jail? Are you gonna keep protesting on Monday? Yeah. What do we want? Healthcare! I am willing to give my last breath to save our democracy. What are you willing? Thank you. Liz, I'm having trouble breathing. I just think we have to stop. Our time on this earth is the most precious resource we have. <laughs> Movement building allows me to transcend my body. And that's the beauty of democracy, that together we can be more than our individual selves. The paradox of my situation is, the weaker I get, the louder I become. That's beautiful. Um, it's moving and it's inspiring. Um, I'm going to ask, I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to ask if everybody uh, can do your part. That's BeAHeroFund.com. Uh, please do go. Please be generous. And, um, and uh, with that, uh, I'm going to uh, thank uh, our incredible guests today for their inspiration, their fight, their work, uh, and their effort on behalf of Medicare for All and all of us. Uh, thank the incredible Be A Hero team. Uh, for their work behind the scenes making today possible. Um, and uh, and thank you all for, for giving us your time uh, and your treasure uh, toward a fight that is uh, decidedly worth fighting, the fight of a lifetime um, for, uh, for our good friend, Adi. Uh, and, um, and with that, uh, thank you again. I hope that you all have a fantastic evening. Please do stay safe. Um, and, uh, and thank you for being uh, with us tonight.